1988, the day was August the 8th, better known as 8 8 of 88. I was in 8th grade that year. And there was a book that came out called 88 Reasons Why Christ Would Come Back, 8 8 of 88. It was a huge deal, huge phenomenon back in America back in that day. How many of you remember that? Anybody old enough to remember that? Yeah, 8 8 of 88. And this was such a big deal that my mom who's typically very sound, very solid. Uh, she wanted to make sure that her kids were all set to go. And so what she did was on our way to school, we lived in a little city called Lasseter, Texas, 41 people in the entire population. And on our way to school, she stopped in a parking lot and she wanted to make sure that her babies, uh, Paulina, Amanda, and I, that her babies knew Jesus. So just in case uh, the Lord came that particular day, we were ready to go and she didn't have to go without us. And the problem was, was my mom scared the bejesus out of me, okay, when, when we stopped and we began talking about this. So much so that that entire day when I was at school, I was a little bit panicked. And I was in the hallway, the very, this actually was the very first day of school. I was in the hallway putting my books in the locker when all of a sudden they decided they were going to do a fire drill. And <laughs> And I just thought that was the trumpet of the Lord, and baby, we were out of there. And I was extraordinarily nervous because I was still here. And I thought maybe, hey, he came and, and, and went, and I stayed here. I was totally paranoid, but, but I was quite satisfied to know that everybody else stood around as well. So either that was just a fire alarm, or the Lord came, and we're all doomed. I have no idea. But, but people get really anxious around the end of the world. How many of you remember uh, a, a, few years, a few months back, a guy by the name of Harold Camping, he predicted the end of the world last May. Do you remember that? Okay, congratulations, you all survived the end of the world. That was great. Well, this coming up, December 21st, 2012, is another big day. Because how many of you know about the Mayan calendar that's coming to end on December 21st, 2012? Uh, you, can, you know what? You guys can, might as well go ahead and put all of your money into the heart for the house offering that's coming up, okay? Because the world's going to end that day, right? Well, that's, we're all paranoid. In fact, Hollywood did a movie... Uh, did a movie on this simply called 2012, and it's a cheesy movie. The graphics are okay, but it's a movie on this whole concept. Well, here's what they tell me. They tell me that when the world comes to an end on December 21st, 2012, that it's going to be destroyed by uh, apocalyptic floods. That's what they tell me. Or they say it could be destroyed by another planet or a meteor running into our planet. Or they say that when, the, when, when it happens, the sun is going to sort of split in two and we're going to get seared by the sun. That, that could happen. I have no idea. Maybe it could get destroyed by aliens. We have no idea what's going to happen. But here's what I know. I can guarantee you that the world is not going to end on December 21st, 2012. In fact, I'm so confident of this that I am willing to put our heart for the house offering, our goal is $30,000. I'm actually willing to bet you $30,000 that the world is not going to come to an end on that. And so you say, Chad, you know, how can you be so confident? Well, if you're willing to go in a bet with me, I would love it. And what we'll do is we'll, we'll put this bet, I'm not normally a betting guy, but but I'm so confident I'm willing to make this bet and we'll settle on the 22nd. And so here's what's going to happen. If I'm right and we're here on December 22nd, you pay me the $30,000. 
If I'm wrong, well, you win. That's, that's all I'm saying. So, but it's the end of the world. We're going to be talking about it. We're doing at least a three-week, possibly a four-week series on, on this uh, particular topic. Some of you see me in a suit, and you're like, wow, maybe the world is coming to an end. I don't know. Chad's in a suit. I have no, I have, uh, no idea. You may notice that our numbers are really low tonight. It's not because the end of the world has come and half our crowd raptured. Uh, we actually have family camp, and they tell me they got about 75 of us down there in uh, San Diego today. But uh, we're going to talk about the end of the world. So you're going to need your Bibles, and we're going to be flipping everywhere today. So how many of you brought your Bibles? Let's see your sword. Awesome. You're going to need these. If you didn't happen to bring one, inside your bulletin you should have some sermon notes, some follow-along notes, and I think I put the scriptures in there as well. But Matthew chapter 24 is where we're going to be. Matthew chapter 24. Well, this week what we're going to do is we're going to be looking at some signs. Everybody say signs. signs. Next week we're going to be looking at the rapture. And then the following week, we're going to do a, what I call snapshots of the book of Revelation. We're going to take a tour through the book of Revelation. That's at least going to take us one week, possibly two. We will we'll see about that. Well, what is a sign? Okay, today we're going to talk about signs. What is a sign? If I was to ask you what a sign is, you would say, well, it's just a, it's a sign, right? Well, a sign is something that can show me what's ahead. For instance, if you're driving on the interstate, you know, perhaps you're, you know, on, you know, I-10 and, and you're, uh, you know, going east and, you know, well, man, I'm really thirsty. I need a, I need a drink. Well, you can look at a sign and it'll tell you what's ahead and it'll tell you if there's a McDonald's or a Carl's Jr. ahead or perhaps it'll tell you about a rest area or, or whatever you need. A sign is simply something that can show you what is ahead. And so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at signs of the end times today but here's what you have to, be, have to know, is anytime scripture talks about prophecy, one, most people get wigged out, two, uh, there's a sensationalism that comes along with this, and what happens, you have to know about prophecy, is that most of the prophecy in the scriptures, whether Old Testament or New Testament, is symbolism, okay, and symbolism is open to interpretation. So if anybody stands up here and tells you that they know, that they know, that they know, well, I would really caution you on that because symbols aren't the easiest, easiest interpreted. And so there are guys who make a living that can deceive you. We'll see that in just a moment. That can deceive you about this. So what you have to know is most prophecy in Scripture is symbolic, okay, open to interpretation, but there are a few things that we know. So let's, let's stick today with a few things that we know. Here's the first thing that we know if you're following along. We know that the Bible is crystal clear on the certain return of Christ to this current age. That's what we know, okay? And so because of that, our bottom line is, is we as Christians have a hope that Christ is coming again. That's our bottom line. And the next slide says that the Bible is completely clear on the certain return of of Jesus Christ. Now, this is the Word of God. This is the Scripture. How many of you know that this Bible is not a book? Anybody know that? The Bible is not a book. The Bible is actually a collection of 66 books put into one volume, okay, written over thousands of years by 40 different authors inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. And what happens with the Bible is throughout history, many times there were prophecies that came or dreams or, or revelations that came that are recorded in here. Well, all throughout Scripture, through this big, gigantic volume of 66 books, one thing is crystal clear, is that 20% of the Bible is devoted to prophecy, 20%. There are five times as many prophecies about the second coming of Christ as were about his birth. In the New Testament, which is where most of us land, okay, where most of us study, in the New Testament. In the New Testament alone, there are over 300 prophecies alone about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Put that in perspective for you. One out of every 30 verses in the New Testament deal with the imminent return of Jesus Christ. One out of 30. Let's, let's see how, how this ranks, okay? In America, if you call yourself American, okay? One out of 19 people who call themselves Americans live in Los Angeles. Do you know that? One out of every 19. So as you put that into perspective, you know that there's a whole big world out there, but one out of every 19 of us call ourselves Americans live in L.A. Well, one out of every 30 verses in Scripture, even though it's a huge book, one out of every 30 verses call themselves prophecy that deals with 
the imminent return of Jesus Christ. That's why we want to talk about it today. Okay? Um, here's one thing else that we know. So one, we know the Bible's crystal clear. Another thing is, is that no one can know when Christ is going to return. Nobody knows that. Harold Camping, our dude who predicted the world was going to come to end, was it last May, last April, last May? Do you remember that? He actually gave us a day and a time and an hour. Well, one thing, have you ever heard that, you know, nobody can know, the, you know, when Christ is coming? You ever heard that? Well, that's actually a myth. You actually can know. We're going to show you that in Scripture. But Harold, who predicted this, probably forgot one verse. Look at it in Matthew chapter 24. He probably forgot this particular verse. Can you put that on the screen for me? It says, no one knows about the day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor who, nor... So if Jesus doesn't know when, when he's going to be coming back, how in the world can Harold Camping know when he's coming back? So what, you're, what my encouragement to you is you've got to be very careful. When you start getting these people who predict the coming of the Lord or the end of the world or the end of the age, you've got to be really careful because when they give you a day, a time, and an hour, I can guarantee you they are false prophets because not even Jesus himself knows that. However, with that being said, even though we don't know the day or the time, Scripture clearly teaches us that we can know the season of Christ's second coming. Go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 16, okay? We're going to be all over Scripture today, okay? Matthew chapter 16. I want you to see this. We can know the season. Everybody say season. season. Not summer, spring, fall, or winter, but a time. Here's what he says in chapter 16, verse 2. It says this. He replied, when evening comes, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky, but you can't interpret the sign to the time. In other words, what Jesus is saying is, listen, just as you and I can predict the weather, okay, by looking outside and seeing if it's cloudy or whether it's sunny, that same exact way as believers, we need to be able to know when the Lord is coming. We should be able to know that. Just like we can tell the temperature, we should be able to know, to know the season. You should be able to know that. Why? How can you know it? By looking at the signs of the end of the time. So as we look into the signs here, I want to give you a goal. What is our goal? Chad, why are you spending time on this? Why are you boring me to death? Bring out the funny stories. Bring out some of the, the good application. Why in the world are you going to spend three weeks or four weeks on the end of the world? Well, one, because a lot of people are going to be talking about it as the Mayan calendar comes to an end on December 21st, 2012. So we want to be relevant for you. We want you to know it. But the second reason is, is because we want, to, we want to do something, and here's our goal. It's to move you from fear to faith. Some of you are paranoid about the end of the world. Some of you are paranoid about it. And we want to move you from fear to faith. We want to get you from apathy. Some of you just flat out don't care. You're apathetic about it. We want to move you from apathy to anticipation. And we want to move you from doubt. Some of you don't believe in God or you're having doubts about God. We want to move you from doubt to decision. So that's our goal. This is why we want to dive in and we want to talk about you. So let's look at some signs. There are three different types of signs. Go back to Matthew 24 and we're going to break down these particular signs. Who's that comedian, uh, Bill uh, Ingball? What did he say? Here's your sign. That's what we should have called that. This, see, I'm too late. We should have called this sermon, here's your sign. That was a little more funny than that. Matthew chapter 24. This particular passage of scripture, uh, if, you're, if you go to Bible college or whatever, you would know this as the Olivet Discourse or, or the Olivet Prophecy. And Jesus is talking about what it's like, going to be like when he returns. So let's look at it. Let's start with verse 1. Matthew 24. You ready? Jesus left the temple. Now, he was in Herod's temple here, a beautiful temple of the day. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call attention to its building. So Jesus is walking out of the temple. And he's walking away, Jesus, and the disciples said, hey, Jesus, look, you know, probably pointing out the beautiful sculptures and the gold statues, and, you know, you know I, don't, I don't know if that is a steeple or a bell tower, I have no idea, but they were just pointing out the magnificent of this building, and, and um, the disciple says, Jesus, look, Jesus says, verse 2, do you see all these things? I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be left on another, every one 
will be thrown down. So he gives them this, this picture that, you know, this big, beautiful building we're in, okay, it's all going to come tumbling down. Well, 40 years, okay, as you study this, 40 years after the buildings came down, or after uh, Jesus said this, the building actually came down. A guy by the name of Titus the emperor, a Roman emperor, came in, and he waged war against Jerusalem and the Jews of this particular era, okay, and, and it was a massive thing. Over 600,000 Jews died in this particular attack, most of them from starvation. And the first thing that Titus did and he and his soldiers, is they went to this particular temple and they lit it on fire and just burnt the thing down. Well, inside this magnificent building, there were these stones and all of this gold. And what happened is, is in the fire, the gold melted and sort of became like mortar inside of these stones. So after they had raided the entire city, the soldiers came back to this particular temple. And in order to get the, the gold out, they began chiseling away and literally removing one at a time, removing those stones and literally caused the entire building to topple down on itself. And I thought it was very cool that Jesus specific prophecy about what was going to happen actually happened because of this destruction. It's pretty cool. Move on. Verse three. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, hey, tell us, when is this going to happen? And what will be the, everybody say this next word, what will be the sign, here's your sign, of your coming and, and of the end of the age. Now, are the disciples wanting to know, uh, you know, about the second coming of Christ? Is this what they're asking? No, because, because they're naive. They, they don't know what's going to be happening in the future. What they're asking Jesus basically is, hey, when are you going to come and like, you know, set up your kingdom and beat the crud out of the Roman Empire and become king of the Jews? When are you going to do this? So Jesus goes on to answer their question. This is the question Jesus answers. He says, verse 4, watch out that no one deceives you. Underline that in your Bible. There's so much deception that takes place when we study the end times. Verse 5, for many will come in my name claiming I'm the Messiah and will deceive many. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you're not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All of these are just the what? Are just the beginning of birth pains, okay? You know, Teresa, when you were pregnant, I mean, we had wars and rumors of wars and famine and earthquake all around the birth of Archer, right? Well, is that what he's talking about? Is he talking about birth pains of a baby? No, no. What he's saying is, is this is the beginning. This is what you're going to know is going to happen when, when the end of the world is coming to an end. These things are going to be, begin happening. And so he gives us some signs. Well, the first sign, if you're taking notes, if you're following along, is signs pointing to the end. Everybody say pointing to the end. Um, I used to have a, a Fiero. You guys know what a Fiero is? A Pontiac Fiero? Okay, 1988, baby. I drove a flaming Fiero, okay? And mine was a white flaming Fiero. That's what they called it, okay? And the reason why they called it flaming was because the engine was in the back and some genius put the gas tank attached to the engine. So what would happen is a lot of times you would get rear-ended, the engine would go through the gas tank, the whole thing would blow up and the end of the world would come, okay? That's typically what they did. So anyway, so I'm driving, I'm a young, uh, young guy, um, and, and I'm driving the car, and, and uh, all of a sudden, my, my check engine light came on. You guys ever have a check engine light come on? In fact, mine and my Volkswagen is on right now, I've got to do something about that. But, well, my check engine light is a sign pointing to things that come. It doesn't mean that the car is going to blow up immediately, it doesn't mean your engine is going to die immediately, it's simply pointing to something that's coming. Well, this is what Jesus is doing in verse 1 through 8 of this passage. He's giving us some signs pointing to what's ahead. Well, here's what we know about these signs. What are they? They're wars, they're famines, they're earthquakes, they're false messiahs. He says, don't be deceived by these. These are just the beginning of the birth pains. Well, here's what we know about these signs. These signs have been true in every generation. These signs have been true in every generation. From every generation, from the time Jesus spoke this until now, there have been wars, there have been rumors of wars, there have been famines, there have been earthquakes. It's been true of every generation. But something else that is true is this. These signs are going to have their fulfillment in a final tribulation period. 
So there's going to be a tribulation. We're going to talk, Bob's going to talk a little bit about it next week, and I'm going to wrap, bring it to an end um, when we go through Revelation in a couple weeks from now. But the, Jesus' warning about these signs is, hey, don't be deceived. They're going to have their ult, ultimate culmination during the tribulation. For instance, in the tribulation, there is going to be wars and rumors of wars. But in the tribulation, there's going to be the ultimate war, a war we call Armageddon, okay? In Revelation chapter 6, it speaks a little bit about the tribulation, and it talks about a false Christ. Well, there are false messiahs. But in the tribulation, there's going to be the false messiah of all false messiahs, and we call him the Antichrist, right, okay? And it's going to culminate during this particular time. So even though there have been wars and rumors of wars about these particular signs from every generation, from Jesus until now, there's coming a point where it will all culminate, and that's going to happen at the tribulation. Are you with me? Now, what's Jesus warning about these signs? His warning is to not be deceived. What he's laying out here, and what he's telling us this morning, is planet Earth is not the final plan for his children. There's something else that's coming. There are signs that are pointing. It's just simply the check engine light. Okay, that's all that's happening. When he gives you wars and rumors of wars and famines and earthquakes, all that is is simply the check engine light that something is, is coming. The second type of sign is this. It's not signs pointing, but it's signs proceeding. Take my Fiero. Check engine light came on. I ignore it. Not a big deal. A few weeks later, maybe a month later, all of a sudden I hear a grinding in my engine. Well, that's no longer a sign pointing that something may be wrong. That's a sign proceeding that something major is getting ready to happen. I can't ignore that. I just can't turn my radio on. I mean, how stupid would I be if I hear this big, gigantic, loud noise in my engine? How stupid would I be to turn my country music, yes, I love country music, to turn my country music on nice and loud so I can't hear the noise? Oh, you hear that noise? Nope, but I love this song. I mean, you would think I was ridiculous, right? Well, isn't this the same exact thing that you and I do many times? Is the Bible gives us signs that precede the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we do is we just simply choose to ignore them. We ignore the signs that are flat out obvious. Well, there are signs. Now, what are these? We've got a few of them, so I'm going to just jump right into it. Okay, these aren't simply the, the engine light that points to something. It's the grinding, grinding that precedes it. Don't avoid this. Let's study it. Because we ought to be able to study Scripture, know the culture, and see the season that we're living in. So what are the signs? The first one is there will be a great apostasy. Look at me, verse 10 of this passage, chapter 24. What is an apostasy? Okay, it's not a glue. What is that called? That's an epoxy, not an apostasy. That was also more funny than what you gave it credit for. <laughs> Verse 10, look what scripture says. At that time, many will turn away from their faith. At what time? At the end of the times, right? The signs proceeding. At this time, many will turn away from their faith and will betray and hate each other. The word apost the, that apostasy word right there is a big church word. It simply means people who claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, people who claim to be sons and daughters of Jesus Christ, will come to a point where they turn their back and they deny and walk away from the faith. That's what it means. There's going to be a great apostasy. Look at, um, go, go uh, flip over to the right a few books, the Second Timothy. Second Timothy. I don't know if you guys take notes or you follow along, but, but, but this is really good. 2 Timothy chapter 4, I want you to see this. Verse 3, how am I doing on time? I'm good. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. So there's going to come a point, when, you know, here's the, here's the grinding before the car blows up. Okay, there's going to come a time when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Okay, instead, everybody say instead. What are they going to do? Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. So in other words, what's going to happen is there's going to be a great apostasy. The church, people in the church, are going to turn away and walk away from their faith. And what they're going to do is they're going to fire their pastor. 
and they're going to go get another guy, and they're going to pay him money to come in and to teach a doctrine that sort of tickles and is music to their ear. Now, understand what I'm saying. I'm talking about sound biblical doctrine. They're going to, they're, they're going to come to a point where they say, you know what, that's just not relevant anymore. And if we're going to grow our church, we've got to get rid of sound doctrine, and we have to replace it with something else. And I don't know about you, but I think that's happening a lot in our churches today. Now, don't confuse, though, sound doctrine with simple doctrine. One of the guys that I admire and respect a lot in the ministry is a guy by the name of Andy Stanley. I grew up listening to his father, a wonderful man of God, great preacher of the word. His son, Andy decided to start a church where unchurched people like to come. It's an offshoot of First Baptist Church, and, and uh, they started 15 years ago. And when they started, they started with a few people, and now here they are 15 years later. It's the second largest church in America. Well, one of the accusations against Andy is that he's this guy. He's the, he's the guy who's giving false doctrine. Well, I caution that because Andy's one of the best theologians that I know. He knows Scripture extraordinarily well. But what he does, he takes the complex, and he boils it down, and he makes it simple. Don't confuse that, because a lot of churches that God is really blessing, and their doors are being blown off, they get a lot of attack from churches like ours. Don't confuse simple doctrine with bad doctrine. Okay? I like what Andy says all the time. He goes, it's not that I'm not deep, it's just that I'm clear. And sometimes in church, what we do is we confuse depth with confusion. A guy will get up and he'll say something, and you're like, whoa, that's confusing. Wow, deep. That was. And we say, we, oh, I want depth. Feed me. Well, don't confuse simplicity, simple doctrine, with bad doctrine. But I think this has happened a lot in our world where, some, where they're coming in and they're taking guys who preach the word and, and, and you have other guys who are preaching prosperity gospel. You have guys who it's a name it, claim it, blab it and grab it, you know, you know, become a Christian and you're going to become a millionaire. Okay, all the prosperity stuff that you hear, you have to be really careful with that stuff. Why? Because I think that is doctrine that is simply music to, to the ear but not necessarily from the word of God. And so one of the signs that the end of times is going to come is there's going to be a great apostasy. People fall away. And, and what's going to happen is people are going to come in and they're going to preach a false gospel. Let me move on. What else is going to happen? There's, there is, uh, there's going to be an increase in personal evil. An increase in personal evil. Now before I get to the scripture, I want to give you one last clarification on my last point. What's going to actually going to happen with the great apostasy is there will become fair weather Christians who want the blessings of God without the commitment to Christ. And I want to share this because I want to just talk to you a little bit, okay? At this church, we don't bang you upside the head on, about money very often, okay? We're not screaming at you and preaching at you and telling you you're going to hell if you don't, you know, we're not doing that, okay? Um, in fact, one of the criticisms about my ministry is that, that I don't hit you up for the offering all the time. In fact, more times than not, I forget about the offering, okay? But as I began studying this, I said, you know what? We really need to be careful, because there is a doctrine in giving that sometimes I do a lousy job of, of teaching. And it's a concept of, 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 it's called the law of the harvest. You know, what I sow I will reap. Give and it shall be given unto you. Okay? It's, it's the command and the principles of God. Well, what happens sometimes is Christians want to have the blessings of God without the commitment to God. So if, um, a guy that I grew up knowing, it was a guy by the name of Dr. Jack Hiles. At the time, Dr. Jack Hiles was the pastor of the largest church in America, First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. Back when I was growing up, that was the largest church. It was the first, one of the first churches in America, the top 20,000 20, people. Dr. Jack was an unbelievable or, um, speaker, and you would come to him, and he would pray for you. And more times than not, if you had an illness, when you came to Dr. Jack, for prayer, he would lay hands on you and he would pray for you, and more times than not, you would get healed. So because of that, at the end of his services, boy, the, the lines that, you know, for altar time, you were really long and people were coming up to get healed. And Dr. Jack learned, after many years in ministry, that he would ask two questions. You know what two questions he would ask? First question was, 
is, are you a Christian? There's no sense in praying for your healing if you're not a Christian. So he would ask them, are you a Christian? And they would say yes. Second question he would ask is, do you tithe? And if they said no, he would say, well, I'm not going to pray for you. You go back and you learn the, the concept of, of giving, and then I will pray for your healing. And he used to get a lot of cri- criticism for that. And I heard him speak one time uh, about this. And he said, he said hold on a second. He, go, he goes, why should I pray for somebody's healing, in other words, the blessing of God to fall upon their life, if they're not doing the things in obedience to receive the blessing of God upon their life? And that really, that really has, has, has astounded me. Now, he got a lot of criticism because what, what, he, what people were saying was, oh, well, you're telling them you give and then I'll pray. And he says, no, what I'm trying to teach them is you make a commitment, the commitment that God calls upon you to do, you commit to God and the blessings of God will come upon your life. And, and, and if you are giving to God and the blessings of God are not coming upon your life, and then, then I will pray and ask God to keep his word and to give you the blessings of God. And he began teaching this, and his church is prospered, and the people in his church began to prosper. Well, if that was taught today, oh, dear Lord. I mean, you would run, you, then people would get run out of town. But the premise and the principle is the same. Listen, at the end of the day, there are going to be people who come and who are going to expect the blessings of Christ to fall upon their life, but will not and will have not done what it takes to receive the blessings, and they will get mad at God for not pouring it upon them. Are you with me? Yeah. There's a great apostasy. Second thing, there's an increase in personal evil. 2 Timothy 3 says this, but mark this. So in other words, pay attention. Here's another sign. Here's your sign. There will be terrible times in these last days. See if this is familiar. People will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money. Boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents. Ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, love, lovers of pleasure, pleasure rather than lovers of God. And watch this, verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. What does Paul tell us to do? Have nothing to do with them. There's going to be an increase in personal evil. Am I the only person who thinks that we could be speaking about the 21st century right here? I mean, man, we live in L.A., don't we? And does this not sound like Los Angeles, California right here? But here's what's interesting about this is you, this could be said of Hollywood and of Los Angeles, but unfortunately, this is becoming more and more prevalent within the church. And there's going to be an increase in personal evil. Another one. Scoffers will come. 2 Peter 3. For first of all, here's your sign. You must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come scoffing and following their evil desires. How many of you guys know uh, the guy named, a guy who looks just like me, he's got the physique of me, a guy named Tim Tebow. You guys know Tim Tebow? Yeah. You're blushing. Relax. Oh, my goodness. Oh, Tim. <laughs> Tim Tebow, quarterback for the New York Jets. Yeah, I know. Uh, pretty incredible guy, actually. Pretty incredible guy. This guy, uh, diehard believer, played for the University of Florida, won, uh, won the Heisman at least once, if not twice. He won twice, one time. Won the National Championship twice, Heisman uh, Trophy once. And, uh, man, great believer. Always testifying for God. In fact, what happened um, when he played for the Broncos last year, they, they ended up going to the playoffs, winning the first game, and he would get down on one knee after he threw a touchdown, and he would do this. And we, re- we created a word in the English language, and it's called Tebowing, right? Okay? And so what was happening is there for a while, this guy was a great believer. Uh, he would get up, and he would give praise and glory to God. Well, there was a, an article written about him when he was looking at dating Taylor Swift. Okay? And... Um, and the, what came out was Tim Tebow, here, here's a guy in his early 20s, uh, is a virgin. And the question came about when he was, was going to date Taylor Swift was, were you going to remain, were you gonna remain a virgin? And he said, you know, yes, you know, that's my plan, I, you know, yada, yada, yada. 
Well, what happened was the, the tabloids began picking up this, and they took what was a very admirable thing, and they began scoffing at him and making fun at him. In fact, there was a countdown that was created, the end of Tebow virginity, and they created a countdown clock until the end of, of his virginity, right? And, and a particular t- uh, tabloid, you may know it, called TMZ. You guys ever know that? Some of you spend way too much time watching that on television. Okay, and they make a point now that before any interview, just as Tim Tebow says, you know, first of all, I want to give praise to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they do a thing called first things first, and now before any interview that they do with him, they ask him, are you still a virgin? They're beginning to scoff at him. Well, this is what's going to happen, is when we begin living lives of Christianity, okay, this is going to happen in the end of the days, when we make a full commitment to Christ, scoffers will laugh at us. That's a sign of the end of the times. Another one is there will become many false prophets. Verse 11 of chapter 24 says, Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. In fact, in the last 50 years, I confirmed this with two sources, in the last 50 years, over 1,100 people have claimed to be the Messiah. 1,100 people. In fact, at the church that I served at in Arizona for a couple years, North Phoenix Baptist Church, Big O Church, and uh, it's, it's a quite a popular church. You may have heard of it. A guy by the name of Senator John McCain goes to that church. And I used to play the piano for their contemporary service. And we were sitting in church one day. And all of a sudden, it's a big old sanctuary, 5,500 people. And uh, uh, we're sitting in church and we're looking. And this guy comes walking through the back door. And what was interesting about this guy, he was dressed in all black, had really long, strangly hair, and he had black sunglasses on, which was interesting because we're inside. And, and he's walking toward the front. And he's walking toward the front. And we're like, okay, he's going to sit down. And he takes a few more steps. Oh, he's going to sit down. He's taking a few more steps. And then it, it's quite apparent he's going on the stage. Well, Pastor Dan Yeary, who was the pastor, he was an older guy in his late 60s, early 70s. You know, he was over here teaching, and, and you know, he was preaching to this group of people. Well, this guy walks on right in the middle of the stage and puts his arms out like this and says, I am the Messiah! Worship me! The problem was he wore glasses. And if you're going to claim to be the Messiah, you better not be shopping at Lens Crafters. Okay, you know what I'm saying? That's all I'm saying. And so he's up here. Well, Dan is old, and he's not finding out what's going on. All of a sudden, he turns around and sees the guy, and he goes, oh, well, hello, friend. And something that we found out about this Messiah was Dan Yeary's bodyguards were a little bigger than this guy. And they walked up, grabbed this guy, and body slammed him, and then carried him out of the church, right in the middle of church. It's crazy. And all i got to say is if you're going to claim to be the Messiah, don't be wearing spectacles, and you better be able to whoop a couple 75-year-old bodyguards. That's all I'm saying, if you're going to claim to be the Messiah. Well, here's the key. What happens is throughout history, there, there comes an increase in severity, and there comes an increase in frequency toward the end of the age. For instance, there have always been wars, right? Do you know that in the 20th century, the, the century we just got out of, the 1900s, The 20th century was the bloodiest century in the history of civilization. More people died in political unrest and in political conflict than in every other century combined. Famine, it's on the increase. In spite of all of our technology, in spite of all our philanthropic behavior, more people will die of starvation today than yesterday, and it increases more and more. Earthquakes, this is a, a quote out of a book written by Hal Lindsey. Earthquakes continue to increase in frequency and intensity, just as the Bible predicts for the last days before the return of Christ. History shows, watch this, that the number of killer earthquakes remained fairly constant until 1950, averaging between two and four killer earthquakes per decade. In the 1950s, there were nine. In the 60s, there were 13. In the 70s, there were 51. In the 80s, there were 86. In the 90s, there were 150. And from 2000 to 2012, there have been over 300 killer earthquakes over the 6.0 on the Richter scale. It's happening with more and more and more frequency. Third sign, and I'm going to be done. Third sign is not the one that points, not the one that precedes, but the one that accompanies the end. What are these signs? Go back to my flame and Fiero, okay? The check engine light came on. All of a sudden, I hear a grind. Well, I drove that car with the grind in it until one day, do you want to know what the sign accompanying the downfall of my car was? When I looked in my rearview mirror and my engine was on fire. 
that accompanied the end of my car, okay? Well, what are these signs? Well, these signs are, look, look at uh, Matthew 24. We'll, we'll uh, go to verse 21. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. There will be unparalleled distress. That's one of the signs. Another one is, these are signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Look at 29 and 30. Matthew 24, 29 and 30. Immediately after the distress, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. Then will appear the sign, here's your sign, then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. In a few weeks, we're going to talk more about the sun, moon, and stars, so I'm not going to spend any time on it today, but here's what we know. When Christ came to this earth the first time, he came as a quiet, humble baby. When Christ comes back the second time, baby, he's not coming quiet, he's not coming humble, he's coming with great power, and all of the nations will see him, and at that point, I'm telling you, we're going to study it, at that point, we will know that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords at that particular moment. i got three minutes left. Can you give me three minutes? Actually, give me five. Can you give me five? Sure. Give me five. How, how do we respond? See how the signs are great. How do we respond? Go to verse 39 of chapter 24. Jesus just finished the signs and says, This is how it will be at the coming of the, of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken, and the other left. Verse 44. So you also must be ready. Because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect Him. If I was to put this in today's vernacular, it would go something like this. We were at a church service one day, and the Son of Man came, and one person was singing a song, and the other one left. You were at your computer at work one day, and one person continued typing, and the other person left. There were two people watching the, a football game, and one person was taken, and one person Remain. This is what he's saying. So what do you do? You must be ready. Go to Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16 says this. Behold, I come like a thief. I was broken into one time. My, my apartment was. And what was interesting was I lived in a place that had a homeowners association. And, and um, the thief homeowners association did not give me a notice that I was going to be broken into. It didn't happen. He says, behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake. Now, is he saying that blessed is he who fills himself with caffeine and never sleeps? No. Blessed is he who stays awake. Now, this could be pretty good advice here. And keeps his clothes with him. So that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. Now, he's not talking about clothed people and nude people here. What he's saying here is, listen, you need to, to stay alert. Be awake, be ready, keep your clothes with you. So when at the end of the time, he's not talking literally, what he's saying is, is have your life prepared, be ready, so when, when one goes and one stays, you will not suffer eternal damnation and judgment. One last scripture. John 14. And if I go and prepare a place for you, say these four words with me. I will come back. And take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. This is one of the most popular verses at funerals all the time. But that whole concept of I will come back. Back in the first century, when Jesus first spoke this, they were awed and marveled at this concept that I will come back. I will come back. That they created a word, and it became a greeting. Okay, uh, I need, can I borrow you, Miss Tebow fan lover? Come here, sweetheart. Okay, so if you were to come, you can stay there. If you were to come to me, no, you know, get my friend, I won't bite. <laughs> if, if, if you were to come in, what's your name? Sam. Sam? Uh, Sam, if you were to come, you know, uh, nowadays, you know, we greet each other like, yo, what's up, Sam? <laughs> you know, this, this is how we greet each other these days, right? Well, back then, they created a, a, a greeting called, called, let me see your hand. 
Maranatha. Maranatha. The Lord will return. The Lord will return. The Lord is coming back. The Lord is coming back. And they would greet each other, not with like fist bumps and blow it up. But they would greet each other with Maranatha. Maranatha. Another, thank you. In other words, what would happen is, is these people in the first century were always anticipating the return of the Lord. So what should our response be? Be ready. Be ready. Don't be exposed if the second coming comes and one is taken and one remains. But always be ready. Always be Maranatha. Ready for the return of the Lord. Amen? Hey, I'm going to pray with us this morning and we're going to sing our closing song. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you, Father, that your word is so true. And Lord, I thank you, Father, that you have promised to prepare a place for us and you will come back for us. So God, we Maranatha. Lord, we are always anxious for the return of our Lord. While the band is getting ready, we're still in a spirit of prayer this morning. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I, I would be remiss this morning if I didn't give you an opportunity to respond to this. You know, our response is that we need to be ready. And the great thing is, in this room, many of us are. So with nobody looking, every head bowed, every eye closed, you say, Chad, I am absolutely ready. That if today were to be that day, and the world would come to an end today, I am ready and I am ready to go. I've done business with God. I'm a child of God. I'm living for Him. I'm not those people who've turned my back on Him, but I am living faithfully to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's you. Can I just see your hand all over this room? Chad, I'm ready. Let me see your hand. You can put your hands down. Many of the hands in this room didn't go up. And you say, Chad, I'm not. I'm not ready. And probably, Chad, I need to do a little business with God this morning. Well, we believe around here it's extraordinarily easy. It's as easy as ABC that you simply admit. Admit that, you, admit that you're not ready. Admit that you've sinned. Be, believe that, that Jesus died for you. And in fact, he's the only one who, who could have. And his precious blood just could cover you. And see, commit to live for him all of your days. Repent of your sins. Cry out to him. Call upon him. And choose to live for him. And we believe that if you do that, you become a believer. So this morning, he said, Chad, I need, to, I need to be ready. Today, I want to cry out and I want to call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that if the world came today, I could say Maranatha. And I could be anxious and ready for the coming of the Lord. So if that's you this morning, Chad, I want to give my life to Christ today. And you did those ABCs with me just all over this room. I'm the only one looking. Would you just slip your hand up so I can pray for you this morning? Chad, I want to give my life to Christ today. Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. Thank you. Who else? Thank you. You can put your hand down. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray a blessing upon these people who raise their hands. And Father, my prayer is, Lord, that they would cry out to you. They would call out to you and call you Father. That, Lord, even right now, while they're sitting there, Lord, they would just confess their sins to you. Lord, that they would admit that, that their own works aren't getting them anywhere. Lord, they would cry out to you. Lord, they would invite you to be Lord over everything in their life. And that, Father, at this moment, you would reach out, draw them unto yourself, you would call them son. You would call them daughter. We pray this, Father, in your name.